So what I'm gonna ask is, when we go through this, I don't want any conviction or any opinion, any idea to be formed by the way that I deliver this. I want it to strictly be given to you by God. This is something that I do not want to preach. I do not. You know, it's one of those things, I wish it could just be a whole bunch of lollipops and stuff like this. I know that there are some people who like to twist the dagger and make things hurt. They don't. I'm not that person. But when God called me to preach, He didn't call me to preach just parts of the Bible, just the nice, beautiful parts, but the difficult parts as well. So more than any time before that we've ever gone into prayer and worship, we need to ask for His guidance, for His Spirit, for His discernment on this. person that is being spoken of in the scripture and two what is our role in the church not meaning just here in the body of Christ what is our role what are we being called to do right now and whatever situations might be taking place according to this word this is the word of God not my word Amen. If you could please join me in prayer. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we come before you asking for your guidance and for your spirit, my King. There is an immense amount of wisdom in your word, but there's things that are difficult for us to digest. And I fully surrender and submit and understand the fact that I don't fully comprehend this text to the full of its depth. But I do understand that I was led to speak on this today, so we're going to speak on your word, my king. So I ask that you would intervene, that divinely you would just put your hand all over this message and allow us to receive this in a way that is pleasing to you and edifying to your church. To not beat people down, but also not love them to the gates of hell. Father, let us receive your word in spirit and in truth. Let us see with spiritual eyes and spiritual discernment, my king. In the mighty, precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray.
James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25. And I get an amen when everybody's there. James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straight, straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. How often do we hear the word of God and not become doers of the word of God? Are we doers of the word? there a certain something that when we wake up in the morning or when situations arise we end up picking the path that the word of God says before us as opposed to what our flesh sets before us is there that inside of us is there that spirit of conviction do we even read the word of God do we spend time looking in the Bible for answers, for comfort, for knowledge, for wisdom? Or do we just read the verse of the day? If that. Or things that we see on the internet. We go about it. Or is there any kind of intimacy between us and the Bible? Because every answer that we need here on earth is found in the Word of God. We confess we're reading an easy text to decipher that the word of God is perfect that his way is perfect and what we read here we can apply it to our lives but what about when things become very difficult like what we talked about what about when the word doesn't really leave any gray area it's pretty black and white where do we stand then? Most important, I want you to remember that you must, we each must, ask the Spirit of God to give us discernment for texts like these. We cannot put them away. If it hurts, that means we need to spend some time in it. If it cuts, we need to spend some time in it. We need to be applying this to our lives because a big part of the reason why the church of christ why us as individuals are in the state that we are in as opposed to where we could be walking in is because difficult texts like this we put aside it's hard to swallow it's hard to act on but don't take my word for it i'm just asking you to read the bible with me today that's it Let's just read the Bible together. Can we do that? Amen? Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. How much sin are we tolerant of? The first two verses. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife and ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he hath that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you now we understand what the letter is writing in context to correct correct understand what's being said here in the sense of somebody has taken their stepmother as their own right 
It's not even named among the Gentiles. It is such a perverted thing. Now speaking in context, a little bit out of context, bear with me. That's pretty disgusting. It's pretty heavy, right? You never hear about things like that, but this is something that had happened inside of the church. So we are not talking about people in the world. We're not talking about them. We're talking about us. What disgusting sins. We all have our closet, right? We all have these things that we're trying to purge out, that we fast about, that we pray about, that we spend time in the Word about, that we ask other people to pray for, because we know that certain people pray for us. But what kind of perverted things have been let into the church? What kind of things have been now tolerated, preached, teached? I'm not just talking about a prosperity gospel. But what things have we compromised friendship for the Word of God? What things have we compromised acceptance for the Word of God and what He has said? We are called to be set apart, not to be a part of. That line of distinction between us and the world has become extremely blurred and very faded. I am not talking about necessarily bashing somebody. I am not telling you to go out, hit somebody with a bat, and throw a Bible and a track at them. But what I am saying is ask God how he is asking you to move in this particular situation as we get deeper into this. Because this must be done out of love, which we will see in a minute. Now where is our eyes? Where is our mind? Is it focused on earth and acceptance or is it focused on somebody's soul in eternity? very very hard to get into this it's very hard to approach these things to pray about these things to receive knowledge and wisdom about these things because this is confrontation these are things that need to be addressed people that are living in sin willful within the church proclaiming Christ but then living in filth I know that there's things in my life that I definitely need to be getting rid of which why I've been praying hard lately the past couple of days i've been getting up early and just kind of like god and then the attacks get harder it's just it's crazy how it works it's crazy how the enemy will work against you but at what point do we throw in the towel and just say oh well it's okay it's just okay for me to walk in this sin to be in this sin how much sin are we going to tolerate in the church Keep in mind, remember that what we're reading about right now is people in the church that are walking in this sin, living in this sin, flourishing in this sin. But we've become okay with it. It's okay. Well, God will change their heart, right? But maybe God is asking us to speak up. I'm not saying in every situation. I'm not trying to speak for your situation. But I am just trying to speak about we need to surrender and submit to God to allow Him to work through us and be bold enough to speak this truth to our heart. And make for certain that when we begin to speak about these things that it is done with an abundance of love and compassion. It has to be done. It has to be. second point we must remember that iron sharpening iron is a difficult process we say it so easily that we forget what iron sharpening iron is actually like think about it in order for iron to sharpen iron that is going to take a lot more work than iron sharpening on a sandstone right think about it think about how iron is sharpened you don't sharpen iron gently, right? It's not going to do anything. It's just going to wear against itself. The only context in which I can see sharpening iron is being placed into a furnace, being pulled out of the furnace, being set on an anvil, and then picking up a huge, heavy iron hammer and hammering a sharpened edge. I never 
thought about that before right now. But that process is fairly difficult. Right? Verse 3 through 6. For indeed, as absent in, in body, but present in spirit, have already judged you, or judged as though I were present, him who has done this deed. So what Paul is speaking about is that he has this authority, this, this divine understanding of the situation, of the circumstances, the discernment that he has from being saturated in the spirit, focused on communion with God, in the word of God, time spent with God, to be able to decipher the situation and what it is that's happening here. Now look, this isn't up for, this isn't debatable, it's not okay. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? He is talking about setting somebody aside. He is talking about speaking to somebody. And when they are so hard-hearted, so closed-minded, that they absolutely refuse to see what you're saying, casting that person out, giving the flesh to the devil, that the spirit might be saved. That sounds kind of harsh. That isn't that love gospel. That doesn't really line up with this whole somebody loves you track. This is deep meat. This is the stuff that hurts. This is the stuff that tears churches apart because there's people that do want the word of God. I do want to be holy. It hurts and it sucks and I'm not good at it. And I, the more that I read it, the more I realize that I'm really not holy. But God, I need you to change me. There's that mentality. And then there's the, well, no, you're just a legalistic person. You're judgmental. You're wrong. But then we also have another side counter of that of how are we how are we speaking about this do we just jump right away to casting this person out we do right let's be honest that's what we do if somebody is walking in a scene we don't really approach them about it maybe we will half haphazardly or like very passively but then they keep doing it so then they we just discard them and we just Maybe we'll go to a different church. Maybe we just won't speak to them anymore, whatever it might be. But we just cast them aside as opposed to actually addressing it. Because the whole purpose, the whole purpose is in verse 5. That the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. That is the purpose. The purpose isn't to neglect this person. This pur the purpose is not to tear this person down and isolate this person. The purpose is somebody's salvation. But we have to be very careful because then it's very easy for us to become puffed up and high-minded of ourselves. Because of what we do or have done or what we have overcome or not succumbed to. We think that we are just better than everybody else. Well, how could they still deal with that? Well, guess what? Well, we're over here judging that thing. Remember the whole verse about the plank in your own eye? That sin that you've been struggling with for years, they overcame immediately. But we love to pinpoint their faults. So all of that to say, what type of mercy or grace is there that we are showing in the midst of a rebuke or a correction or pointing something out they, may not, they might not be aware of? Is that detrimental of a sin or whatever it might be. Whatever kind of sin that the Spirit might be convicting us on individually or as a church of somebody in the, in the church. Whatever the Lord is saying, do not move. Don't, don't utter a single word. Don't take a single step unless the Spirit is directing you. It's not because I preached this message. It's not because I said this or said that. Nothing to do with me. Only what the Word of God is telling you and the Spirit is telling you through the Word of God. That is how we move. That is how we act. That is how a church is built. That is how a church operates and grows and becomes stronger. Not tearing one another down because the flesh is going gonna, is gonna to rise up real quick. 
We're going to get defensive. We're going to start casting stones. We're going to start judging each other, tearing each other apart. You've seen it before where churches will split. Somebody will then decide that they're going to go open up a new church because God is calling them to be a pastor. But God is actually calling them to submit. Surrender. But are we going to be humble? Or are we going to be prideful? Are we going to be arrogant or teachable? Are we going to be led by the spirit of the flesh? That's what all of this is talking about, man. Every single one of us has got sin that we still struggle with and deal with, that we need to be putting away. And it's not okay for us to live in it. That is the biggest and most pressing part that I want to press against you today in the word. What we are reading about is that it is not okay for us to dwell in this sin. The sin needs to be put away. It needs to be put off. It might not be perfected today or tomorrow, but there needs to be an evidence of growth over this time. Or do we really want to be free from it? How, how long have we fasted about it? How long have we prayed about it? Is it the type of thing when we wake up every single morning and ask God to deliver me from this? Maybe for three days, maybe four. Then we'll skip a couple of days and then within two months, we don't even mention it any longer, right? It is not okay for us to dwell in sin. It is not. There are these things that kind of are kind of hit and miss, whether you have some believe that you can eat meat, some say that you can't, so on and so forth. And everybody has scripture to prove their point, so on and so forth. Those are not the things I'm talking about. But we do understand the things that are unnegotiable. living in adultery no hating your brother no being selfish no not fulfilling your ministry no I know that sounds harsh it sounds judgmental it sounds legalistic but if we are not walking calling that God has called us to walk in. There are people that are not being saved. There are people that are not being led to Christ through the blessing that God has shed on our life. These are sins. These are things that are not tolerable. Things that we must step out in in faith. And it's hard. It sucks. I understand that. But we also have to have such a communion with God, such an understanding from God. Sorry for putting my hand on my pocket. My shoulder is just killing me holding it up. That when God speaks, we know that it is God speaking, especially when it comes to another believer in Christ. we could be that word of truth we could be that word of compassion but conviction look I love you I know that you're struggling with this how about we fast together on this so that God would show you victory in this to help you tear down the flesh and be able to walk in the spirit how about that as opposed to you're doing this and you can't do that that's not okay you have to leave the church what do we really want do we really want to see this person saved our brothers and sisters say is that truly something that we want or is it just something that we talk about a third point verses 7 through 9 what we tolerate and what we surround ourselves with is what we become verse 7 purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle, not to company with fornicators. I believe that all of our parents at one point or another had told us, don't hang out with those people because you will be just like those people. 
who you associate with, you will become just like. Who we surround ourselves with is who we are going to emulate. It's who we are going to look like. It's who we're going to speak like. Are we so saturated with Christ and other believers that there is this reek of Jesus on us? That when we speak, they hear Christ or other believers? One of the beautiful things that I absolutely love about my sons is the people that we have around our sons are leading them to Christ, teaching them new words of worship, in the name of Jesus, whatever it might be. These are the things that we see a lot easier is the way that the boys are impacted by who we have around them. But we cannot be foolish and think that we are not impacted the same way. If we are around somebody that is always negative, guess what? We're going to become negative. Right? If we're around somebody that is always negative, we will become negative. If we are around somebody that is always cussing, slowly but surely, we get a little bit more loose with our vocabulary and then something is going to happen and we're going to let it out. Right? I'm very guilty of that. I struggle with that. There's no excuse, but I'm just being honest. But this goes for other sins as well. What might it be? If I tolerate this, and then we tolerate this and this, okay, then now we have a church that everybody is doing this, whatever it might be. Say drinking. We're all drinking. It's okay for us to drink right now. And guess what? We're all drinking. Now we're all drinking a lot. Well, now, I'm encouraging your drinking and you're encouraging my drinking. So then therefore, I'm a drinker. We all know this. So guess what? I'm going to be drinking. And it's going to start off with just drinking a little bit when we're together. And guess what? Slowly but surely, it's going to come into, well, I'm just going to drink a little bit by myself. Then I'm just going to drink a little bit. And then just a little bit more, and then a little bit more. Perfect example. In the afternoon when my grandfather passed, Christian opened up the cabinet where my grandfather's liquor was. I was standing there with my dad, and there was a part of me that thought that, yeah, let's have a little, a little salute. You know, saying goodbye. His body was still in the room. They were just about to walk him out with the American flag over. That thought came into my mind. It never passed my lips, but the thought came to my mind. Now imagine if I had a brother in Christ there that would have encouraged me. There it goes. Almost nine years of sobriety. But there here also comes the liquor. Dude, and it was like stuck right where we left off with vodka at that. That's like the one thing I can't drink. Like I do real bad. I end up getting prison terms when I drink vodka. You don't have to be shy. What would you like me to talk about? I'll tell him. Okay, so, on a side note, the last time that we went to Disneyland, they had the new Star Wars part of the park open, and we saw Chewbacca, and he was really big. Oh, and there were the white soldiers that were the bad guys and they were walking around scaring everybody. Okay, let me get back to the message, okay? And I'll tell... Oh, oh, you're right. Yeah, there's a bad guy. He was making funny sounds and stuff. But let, let me finish, okay? I'll tell them more later. Promise. Hey, hey. Love you. The more sin that we tolerate, the more that we justify sin in ourselves and in each other, the more we look like the world. Hello. I'm sorry, one second. The more 
or that we look like the world. And here's the problem. Something that I've seen happen a lot, and I start seeing it, seeing it in a different light. You know, a lot of times churches want to intrigue people to come. We want to capture people's attention. We're not supposed to fit in with the world. We're not supposed to look like the same way that they do. We're supposed to be so different. Think about it like this. Has, has everybody here seen the movie The Titanic? Now, you remember when Jet... So you guys are going to watch a movie this week. Uh, so, when the ship is sinking, Everybody's freezing in the water. There's some lifeboats. You have people that are trying to get into the lifeboat. Right? You have people that are in the lifeboat. Some people that are trying to help. And other people that are trying to keep them out. The lifeboat is Christ. And salvation. Those that are in the freezing cold water. Are what? Whoa. Let's be honest. Is it safe to say that to a certain degree, at some times, drill a hole? We drill a hole in the middle of our lifeboat so that way we don't offend those that are sinking and we're able to come down to their level and meet them where they are. We're supposed to be afloat. We are supposed to be lifted up in something different. But if we continue to tolerate sin and tolerate worldly living in the body of Christ, there's no difference. Why, why should I come to Christ? Why should I have to give you 10% of my money when I could just go watch a football game and do the same thing you're doing? And just repeat a prayer. Just like you did. That's it. I'm good. I'm doing the same Christian thing that you're doing. Well, no, because I do a Bible study. Awesome. Well, no, because of... Because of... But is there... When we are truly living for Christ, and there is immense amount of sin that is being cast out of our lives, it is appealing to other people. Not to everybody, because a lot of people are so stuck in their sin that they just love it. But there are people that are drowning that are scratching and clawing, looking at different things to find salvation, to find freedom, to find comfort. I saw somebody, burning sage, had crystals, candle of Mary, and like three other things, like a tarot card, like all of these things, all the spirituality, right? They're so confused. None of those go together. They all contradict each other. But what? They're hungry and they're searching. But if we look like them, there's no reason for them to want to come to Christ. They do the same thing you do. There's no difference. Dude, I've been set free. That's why, like, when you see somebody that did hard drugs, like heroin or meth or something like that, not just party, but like was strung out. You see them get clean. It's like, dang, wow. How did you do that? What happened? What happened? Is our change that distinct? Are we that distinctly different from the people we're surrounded with? It's a level of sin that we allow in. A little bit of leaven, a little bit of sin that comes in and kick, just pries that door open. It doesn't kick the door wide open. Gets the door open a little bit, just knocks a little bit gently. Hey, hey, here, here. And the next thing you know, the door's wide open and the house is full of spirits and we're not tormented, we're depressed, we're str we're just we're beating ourselves up because we let the door open to this sin. And this goes for us and it goes for the church, the body of Christ as well. And this is where we have to draw a line. Not a line where I say we draw the line, but where God says we draw the line. Where the Spirit is telling us we need to draw a line. I need you to approach this. I need you to deal with this. I need you to address this. It's hard and it sucks. We lose friends. We do. When we preach the, the message of God, the Word of God like this, we lose friends. 
We lose followers. People don't want to hear what you got to say. And anytime they see you, it's like weird and awkward. And they don't really know what to say. A lot of times it's going to be family that's that way. But that's the truth. This is the truth. The word of God. But if we don't speak the truth, we're just holding people's hands to the gates of hell. That's all that we're doing. We're comforting them in their sin. So they're stuck in bondage. Imagine you know that somebody is kidnapped. Living in a house. They're chained to the wall. But we're so nice and kind and we're such good Christians that we bring them a plate of food. And we sneak it to them. Here you go. But we have the key in our pocket. But I'll pray for you. Here's some food. I'm going to go about my business. And we walk away and go do our thing. This is how we need to be seen, seen. But do we? We have the ability to set people free, to lead people to freedom. But do we care enough to do so? sin must be purged out. It must be pressed out. Like I said, I'm not saying that we need to be absolutely perfect by tomorrow, but there needs to be some substantial growth in six months, in a year, in two years. We can't be dealing with the same sin that we're dealing with today in three months. It can't happen. We're either moving on in Christ or we're standing still or going backward. Going backwards and standing still are no option. We must press on in Christ. We must be growing. We must be coming, be becoming sanctified by the Spirit, being washed and made clean, letting off the old man. We must be growing in Christ. We must. This is what this is talking about. But at a certain point, that becomes uncomfortable. It becomes difficult. We don't want to do it. So we tolerate it. Then our walk is a little bit hindered. And then guess what? We have a whole church full of lukewarm people because nobody wants to convict anybody. Because we don't want to be hateful. Well, here's an, here's an option. Don't be hateful. Don't be hurtful about the way that you approach it. Be truthful, but be kind and gentle. It's part of the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? Amen. The fourth and final point. One of the greatest problems is that the fact that the church does not look much different than the world. Verses 10 through 13. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or railer, or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one not to eat for what we have for what have I to do to judge them also that are without do not ye judge them that are within but them that are without God judgeth therefore put away from amongst yourselves that wicked person we love to judge the world we love to condemn the world and their parties, their choices, their things, all this stuff. But what about inside? And we're not talking about an unrighteous judgment. We're talking about a righteous judgment. Living in sin. Purposely. Willfully. It's not saying here that if some person is suffering with something and you tell them about it, you just cast them away. But if that person continues in their sin, if this person wants to live in this sin they've embraced it they've refused to let go of it okay i love you i will continue to pray for you but i cannot participate in what it is that you are doing the word of god has told me to not even eat with you i love you and i care for you but i cannot sit here and hold your hand while you kill yourself spiritually you are committing suicide. We, when we do these things, and there are things in my head right now that I'm thinking about. When we do these things, these sins, when we exercise these things, I don't care what it is. We are committing spiritual suicide. 
quenching our spirit like you were talking about. We are destroying the spirit that God has given up of wisdom, of strength, of power, of a sound mind. All of these things that we have through the access of God that Jesus Christ has given us, we are killing and destroying by tolerating sin and walking in this sin. Man, it hurts and it sucks being convicted. Get mad. I always joke with my pastor about it. Like when he convicts me, it's like, dude, I like don't really want to hear what you have to say right now. Uh, give me like a week or two and I'll say thank you. But I'm not going to say thank you right now. I'm going to go pray about it and deal with it. Come out of it. It's hard. It's really hard. But it has to be addressed. It has to be. We cannot sit here and tolerate. I'm not telling you to go cast any particular person off. I'm not telling you to do that telling what the word of god says but what is the spirit telling you to do not our own opinion not what is bella telling bella to do or terry telling terry kelly telling kelly or joe telling joe or chris telling chris what is the spirit telling you to do when we go through and read this word what is the spirit telling us to do where do we want to stand there are blessings for being obedient God rains down blessing. We can't see the blessing. We don't even know what the blessing will be 90% of the time. Sometimes we do. But I am telling you that if we are obedient here, God will bless it. God will show us victory in a way that doesn't make sense to us. I love you and I want to see all of us grow. I want to grow. I want to see the body of Christ grow. I want to see the body of Christ stop being a joke to everybody. To actually see something different about us. I want something still different. Yeah, my life is very different from how it was just a year ago. Five years ago. Six, ten years ago. It's different. I still want it to be more different than it is today. I want to be more Christ-like tomorrow than I am today. I want to continue to grow. I want to purge out any sin in my life. And what the Word of God is telling me here is that it includes the people that I'm surrounded with. Who do I have around me? Everybody likes to talk about how Jesus went and sat with the sinners. The tax collectors. He wasn't sitting there hitting the pipe. He wasn't sitting there partaking with them. He wasn't over here stealing money. He was preaching the truth. Not partaking. There is a difference. But also notice that he also went off to make pray. He was surrounding himself with men of God not with sin but we gotta grow do we want it are we willing to listen if the spirit moves and tells us to do something here comes the truck right now I'm gonna close out in prayer and go into this worship but uh Let's think about this for a sec before we get into prayer. Let's think about what we need to be doing, what we need to be casting off of ourselves, ways that we could be loving one another out of the sin that we walk in. Excuse me one second.
your spirit would just fill us with that boldness with that zeal and with that love and compassion my king 
that we would stay minded on the things that are of heaven not in the flesh so when these things come about my king when there's issues that need to be addressed when there's problems that come up my king we're able to do so in a spiritual discernment my king that is able to edify people not push them away not tear them apart my king but to lift them up to encourage them to encourage each other to encourage ourselves my king help us my king to be the church you call us to be to walk in the light you've called us to walk in and continue being sanctified by your spirit until your coming the mighty be to walk in the light you've called us to walk in and continue being sanctified by your spirit until your coming in the mighty precious name of Jesus Christ we pray amen Jesus for all of us. I pray that we don't let you down, Jesus. <laughs>